Aparna Venkatesan is a cosmologist in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of San Francisco and a former NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics, Astrophysics postdoctoral fellow. She works on studies of the first stars and quasars in the universe and is also actively involved in projects in cultural astronomy and space policy. She has been recognized internationally for her research and DEI leadership, featured widely in the media, and received numerous prizes and awards. Dr. Van Katessen is deeply committed to increasing the retention of underrepresented groups in astronomy and STEM and is active in developing scientific partnerships with indigenous communities worldwide. Isabel Hawkins is a senior scientist at the Exploratorium. She was born and raised in Cordoba, Argentina. Dr. Hawkins received her PhD degree in astronomy at the University of California, Los Angeles. She spent 20 years as a researcher at UC Berkeley Space Sciences Laboratory, working on various NASA satellites. She joined the Exploratorium Museum in 2009 to work on cultural astronomy projects. Dr. Hawkins is a consultant to the Smithsonian Institution and a Fulbright US Global Scholar. Julia Goodman's innovative approach to papermaking holds strong through lines with the history of rag paper as she gathers, sorts, tears, soaks, and pulps fibers, transforming discarded bedsheets and t-shirts into malleable pulp. Goodman's work explores personal and celestial cycles. Julia earned an MFA from California College of the Arts and a BA in International Relations and Peace and Justice Studies from Tufts University. Recent exhibitions include the National Museum of Women in the Arts, Washington, DC, Contemporary Jewish Museum, San Francisco, San Jose Museum of Art, San Jose, the Paul Art Museum in Chicago, the Berkeley Art Center in Berkeley, and Equinum Gallery in San Francisco. Her residencies include J.B. Blunk, Recology SF, Creativity Explored, and Selena Art Center. Julia lives and works in Berkeley with artist Michael Hall and their young child. She is represented by Equinum Gallery. And I can't express how grateful I am for these uh, three women and all the ideas and energy they've shared around this program. And it's been an absolute pleasure to work with them and I hope that you all enjoy as well. So please help me welcome to the stage, Aparna, Isabel, and Julia. Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you all warmly. I know it's a weeknight, and I know we're approaching the beginning of the fourth pandemic year. I know we're dragging. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I want to reiterate uh, our respectful acknowledgment of those whose ancestral homelands we live and work on here in San Francisco, the Ramatush Ohlone, and more broadly, the Coast Miwok of Northern California. And for those watching remotely, I honor the traditional custodians of the land, water, and sky where you are. I also want to take a minute to honor the upcoming Lunar New Year. It is one of many ways we connect to the moon. There are so many global cultures that have lunar calendar, Jewish traditions, Muslim traditions, Hindu traditions, and of course, the wonderful Chinese calendar. And the 12-year cycle of the lunar year has a lot of details and divisions and houses within it, 28 houses. But the 12-year cycle is often thought to be really a calculation of Jupiter's orbit around the sun in terms of Earth years, which is 12 Earth years. But again, that's just a little egg left for us by the calendar makers in this tradition. For now, a very happy year of the rabbit, which I am told will bring peace and hope, and I know I need it. Um, so, and I guess many people do too. So, our view of the universe is changing. And our view as a result of our home and our relation and our place in the universe is changing as well. It's one thing to know theoretically that we are literally descended from stars. It's another thing to, as you see here in the upper, upper right, that's the James Webb Telescope deploying and heading out to space. 
uh, best Christmas day ever. Um, and that little dot here where the arrow is, you can find online movies that show it orbiting around L2, Lagrange point two. Um, so when we look out into the universe and the cosmos and we see things that we have put there and we get the view back on Earth, our sense of who we are and our connection, our view changes of ourselves. And as a scientist, I rejoice in this changing, evolving view. These images are relatively recent. To the left is the Falcon Heavy rocket, the Tricor booster from last Sunday's launch, and impeccable and perfect reentry and landing after that. The two little, um, uh, the, the big streak is the main core, uh, which is heading out to space, and the t two little ones left behind are the side core boosters. Um, you may recognize to the upper right uh, increasing streaks in astronomical images from the growing number of satellite constellations in space. And although I speak a lot about that and advocate for a more ethical, slower, responsible approach to space, Nevertheless, the excitement of space exploration remains. Um, we are a curious exploratory species. And to the lower right, uh, we see the Orion uh, spacecraft, part of the Artemis I mission, re-entering on December 11th after a glorious 25 days sojourn. So it's becoming real that we are going back to the moon in a way that is even more than the ways we went to the moon before. And not just the United States, a number of countries are now landing there. A few have tried and not succeeded yet, uh, but it's real. Um, and again, this view, as we look back on our fragile, beautiful home, uh, it's going to change our sense of place in the universe. To the lower right, is that wonderful uh, conjunction of Mars and the moon that happened a few weeks ago. Uh, I saw it in real time with the unaided eye and also through binoculars, but this is an actual telescope image. Um, but I think this is very poignant because I think in going to the moon, we'll go beyond to Mars and even farther. So this era of true interplanetary exploration has really begun starting with the moon. But as we look to this new and exciting future, space is our future, we also remember how space has always been our past. We have such beautiful diversity in this planet, but the fact is that space is our shared ancestor. And this wonderful image from James Webb, uh, in which the light from many of these galaxies left those galaxies before our Milky Way was forming, when you look at this, we can't help but rejoice in our fundamental ancientness, which cannot be ever taken away. Space is our shared ancestor, but it's also our future, uh, whether we explore the moon and beyond, but also where we'll ultimately end in the ultimate recycling program in the cosmos, right? Here's a beautiful image from last summer. It won a bunch of photography competitions of a fallen seal on the floor of Monterey Bay, slowly being returned to its ocean habitat. And when I see this, particularly with the starfish on it, uh, it's very moving. It reminds me where I'm personally headed, uh, you know, when the sun becomes a white dwarf and so on, but that's still five billion years away. Uh, but it's moving, it's very moving. Um, I want to honor the role that the moon has played for all of us to connect to the stability of cosmic cycles and the order and comfort imposed on our human realm, so full of flux, more so, I, I feel every generation feels it's more so now than ever, but I think it's actually more so now than ever. Um, and the moon as calendar, again, returning to the lunar calendar. I was born at full moon. I met Isabel at full moon eight years ago. Uh, and my own dear father passed at new moon. And I'll speak more to that later. But 
I just want to say that when so much seems in flux and change, the skies and the moon provide a grounding calendar and a grounding sense of cycles. And particularly, some of you may know this already, many cultures have very significant holidays at the new moon, which is seen as a resetting of cycles, a time to remember ancestors, and a particular new moon that occurs in the fall months in the Northern Hemisphere is what Indians celebrate as Diwali. Uh, not many people know that that is at that new moon in October or November, uh, and that's the Diwali lamps on our front porch last fall. Moving, bro broadening our view of ancestors and elders. And as we move forward into the future, inviting collaboration with ancestors, past and present, we remember the loss of all the elders we've had, historically, but especially over the last few years, whether it's the COVID pandemic, the loss of redwoods here in Northern California, which are our habitat elders, even the loss of elder telescopes like Arecibo. And as we look at what climate change is doing to erasing you know, ancestral lands, ancestral sites with floods and rising waters and more fires than ever, this is the foreign minister of Tuvalu at COP26 a year and a quarter ago, uh, speaking from the rising waters at Tuvalu that this is real and change needs to happen now. And as we remember all the elders, we are called to reimagine what heritage is. On the moon, yes, we honor boot prints and landing sites, but perhaps we need to honor the moon as our elder and something that has connected us around the world and across the millennia. And to include not just things like landing sites and boot prints and mission sites and UNESCO designated heritage sites, very important, but to see the environment itself as our elder and as our heritage, where it be a coral reef, a mountain on the big island of Hawaii that astronomers want to build more telescopes on, or even the dark skies. Because as we lose elders, we are called to be the elders of the future, and we need to be worthy of the future as we grow into our role as elders and reimagine our heritage. I'll wrap up with just a few wonderful slides. Uh, Isabel has taken me on such glorious travels around the world, and I've met so many wonderful indigenous communities that it has been my honor to learn from. Here is our beautiful moon uh, seen from the beautiful land of Eriatoa and uh, New Zealand. And to the left, you see the beautiful carving of Master Carver, Carver Ukuki Tingi, or Kuki, as we call him. Uh, so that's from beautiful New Zealand. Uh, this is on the big island of Hawaii. You can see the moon in both pictures. These cones you see on the left are at the Imaloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii, and it has three large cones depicting the three large volcanoes on the big island, but I loved watching the moon rise over them. Uh, so the moon connects us and connects us and connects us. Here is a sunset from near my home at Ocean Beach, uh, and maybe you can see the moon up there peeking through. And I will end uh, with just a reminder that the king tides are happening starting today. So please be very careful walking at high tide. In fact, right out those windows, the waters will rise steadily over the coming days. But it's so spectacular at low tides, great time to go tide pooling. And this is again a picture I took at Ocean Beach. Uh, the water recedes so far um, at this time of the year during the king tides. and you just see a lot that you don't normally see, and it's really very beautiful. And I'll end on this picture. We have a mystery mandala artist at Ocean Beach who comes and does the most beautiful patterns in the sand, and I find it incredibly moving because we never see footprints, and this person creates these knowing they'll be washed away in a few hours. So I honor the courage in creating this mandala, a reminder of our fleeting existence in this beautiful universe we live in. Thank you.
to her partner. Thank you so much, Aparna. Julia. Um, thank you, Aparna. Hello. Oh, thank you, Aparna, for your beautiful presentation. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, this means so much for you to all join us. And Isabel for bringing us all together. And Sam and Bella and the whole Explorium, Exploratorium staff for making tonight happen. Thank you so much. Um, Isabel and I have known each other for seven years now. Um, but we had a long break of not seeing each other. And then we reunited in August in uh, Isabel came over to my st our studio, um, and the first piece we started talking about was this um, diptych of handmade paper pieces that were actually cast from the wood mold right here in front. Um, and as I was telling her about the series, it's called um, Waning and Waxing, and the origin story, the the backstory goes back to 2007 when I was mourning the loss of my father. And as I, as I was telling her this, um, she told me about her friend Aparna and the loss of her father during the pandemic and how the uh, moon became your grief calendar. Um, this is a close up of the piece called Waning and these are the phases of the moon um, starting with, I think on the top left corner is the night my father died and then it's the 11 months following the night he, uh, following the phases of the moon following when he passed. And the 11 months are the, is the customary grieving period in Judaism for a child to mourn for their parent. And so although I'd never used that term grief calendar, I realized that's what it had been. And I so wanted to meet you and um, here we are. So um, before making this series, the original series I cast from the wood carving on the right was called 11 Months Morning, August 19th, 2007 through July 14th, 2008. Um, this is one from a series of 11 pieces of handmade paper that I cast again from that wood carving. Um, prior to my dad passing, I was making paper that I would print on. And after he passed, I had this um, very deep craving um, for texture. I wanted to communicate through the things th th that you could feel, and I just was really trying to grasp this very simple fact that after somebody passes, you can't touch them anymore. Um, and I had been very um, moved by the Jewish mourning traditions in the immediate days after my father passed, how physical they were, um, and how they could just kind of guide my body through a process that maybe my brain would eventually catch up with. Um, and this carried over with me into the studio. Um, I s moved to San Francisco 10 days after he passed and started graduate school at CCA. Um, and I was in my studio and I went back, I just started ripping paper to make paper. Um, it related back to a Jewish mourning tradition that I was familiar with called Korea. I don't know if any of you ever heard of it, but the very old tradition is that you would render the um, garment, your outer garment at the gravesite, um, not specifically not on a seam. And then while you're in the mourning period, you would wear the garment with the tear, and it was a way of telling, of exposing one's heart and a way of sharing with the community that you were in, in a period of grief. When the time is over, you sew up the um, tear, and so it is, it's healed, but it has changed. And paper making completely shifted for me, thinking about this process in the studio. Um, so these are the 11 pieces of paper that are part of this series. Um, the first one is this just big chunks of, of junk mail. You can barely read the texture, and uh, through the series, the pulp stayed in the kitchen blender longer and longer and longer, and by the end, it reveals the, te the, the um, surface, the phases of the moon, and this felt like an apt metaphor for like, in the beginning, you can't even say where you are, and, and maybe you, you can as time goes on. Um, in terms of a grief calendar, th this was, the series was an, um, the 11 pieces of paper that hung indoors, 
but there was also a series of actions that accompanied the piece. And so the wood carving was both for casting the paper, but it was actually my calendar for the actions. Um, all of the actions involved handmade paper. They were each 30 days long. This is the example of what I did on the second month. It's very hard to see, but this was used to be what was at the corner of 18th and Mission. I would go there every night, and I would, um, two rectangles to the left of Usher, um, I um, would wheat paste a piece of handmade paper made from junk mail that was embossed with the phase of the moon. And the phase of the moon and the embossment matched the phase of the moon in the sky that night. And I would go back the next day and take a photograph. Um, it was important to me that it be an invitation to share and looking up at the night sky, that it revolve around touch and not sight. Um, and it was important to me that it be outside, that it be in community. Uh, one tradition, one part of Jewish mourning is that you're not supposed to be alone. You're supposed to be in a group. And also in trying to acknowledge mortality, it was important to me that the work be left to the elements, left to human and natural elements. And so it was never a project that was meant supposed, that was meant to last forever. Um, so this is the fourth day, and then I'm going to skip ahead to from October, 10 days later, later. It stops right behind the right side of the bus stop. And then October 20th, you can see it, the stretch all the way across the wall. Um, and then the 11th month, the 11th month, so that was the second month, to wrap up this project, the 11th month, I returned to the same block and did the same series of wheat pastings over again. So this was the third day of the 11th month. And then again, um, six days later, or seven days later. Um, so the series kind of went on. In a way, I could have just done this series of wheat pastings every night for the 11 months. Um, fast forward to 12 years later. Um, when I was pregnant with our child, um, it really felt like this might be the counterbalance to grieving for my father. And so um, during my pregnancy, I, had, I, had, I knew I needed the same size wood ready. And um, after, my child, after our child was born, when I was ready to be in the studio, the first thing I did was chart out the phases of the moon for my pregnancy and um, carve them by hand. Interesting enough, like my body just remembered how to do these wood carvings. I didn't need all the markings. I, I, it was a like a return to myself in a way that I couldn't have anticipated. Um, and so the piece that you see here are the blue, the dark blue pieces, which is waning, is cast from the wood carving I made in 2007, and waxing the light warm pink piece is cast from the uh, wood carving on the left, which is waxing. Um, where 11 months mourning felt like concrete, I really needed this piece to feel um, warmer and more bodily. And I was working with, to achieve that, I was working with color. I didn't want anything to be pure white. Um, I was working with color and the undulation of the form, and also it's hard to see, but there's a slight pink back glow on these pieces. And um, the backs, this is what the back sides of the both pieces look. Um, it's hot pink and neon, hot pink and neon orange um, t shirts that have been pulped and pressed on the back sides so that they have that warm glow, really thinking about um, a sense of vitality in the face of mortality. Um, oh. Thank you. Yeah, there's lots of chairs here too, if you'd like to come closer, but thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank you, uh, Julia, for your beautiful recounting of your process of making this amazing um, expressions of your grief, but of your art, of your creativity, your relationship with the moon, with your ancestors. Same thing. Thank you, Aparna, for uh, taking us through that journey of connection with the cosmos um, and this amazing exploration that is still going on in space. I am an astronomer. Um, 
I uh, have gone through my own journey of relationship with the moon. I have to say that we are approaching King Tide, so this weekend, please be careful. Um, King Tide is happening when uh, three uh, special connections between the Earth, the moon, and the sun uh, are present. So first of all, we have the new moon. It is actually a super new moon because it is at perigee, which is when we are closest to the moon. Um, and also, we are at perigee or close to perigee with the sun as well because we are closest to the sun on January 4th. So all of those alignments create a specially strong high tide and especially low, low, low tide. So please be careful. But notice, let's take this opportunity to notice our relationship with the moon, with the tides, and with these cyclical processes that have been so important throughout humanity and continue to be. You might wonder why it is that we have <laughs> all these textiles here, why it is that we have this amazing art, is because it's all related to the moon. We came together as part of uh, a response to this natural phenomenon of the kink tides, but also our own personal and professional relationship with the moon. Um, and here, here she is. You will see, or maybe you have seen, our beautiful uh, piece that we have in the central gallery, uh, the big, big rendition of the moon, and be able to see all sides, even the side that you do not get to see from, from Earth. Um, and you might notice all these dark patches. Well, these dark patches for the cultures that I have been working with, which are Mesoamerican cultures primarily over the past few years, from Guatemala and um, from southern Mexico, in the Maya tradition, the moon is the goddess or the deity of weaving. It is a rabbit, and it is the deity of fertility, of midwifery, and of medicine. And so in many of these weavings, you will find iconography that is cosmological, that has to do with the cosmos and our relationship with stars, with nature. And also many of the natural pigments that are showcased in some of these textiles are also driven by phases of the moon. So here she is, Ischel, the, the goddess of the moon in the Maya tradition, carved in white jade. And uh, here's a very talented uh, young woman in Almolonga um, uh, in the Quiche area of Guatemala. Her name is Sofia Siquina, and she's a master weaver. And here's a collage of uh, many of the people that I have worked with for several years and showing, especially on the upper left, you see a purple yarn with um, a, a shell. What it, it is a sea snail that gets harvested in the co west um, coast of Oaxaca. And this is done during high tide, very dangerous work. The snails come up on the rocky areas during low tide, they get harvested out, they milk them, and then they return them to the ocean. So it's a sustainable practice. The, the yellow secretions that come from the mollusk turn purple uh, when uh, they come into contact with oxygen. And the textile that's on the floor there that is kind of light purple, uh, it is dyed with uh, purpura panza, which is the name of this snail. And when I first purchased this uh, in Oaxaca, you could rub the textile together, put it against your nose, and you would smell the ocean. Uh, now I've been wearing it for many years, so it's been washed many, many times, and I don't smell the ocean anymore. But it was a, a great connection that way. Um, so if you want to know more about these pieces and their connection with the moon, there are tags in there with more explanation. We invite you to please peruse them. You may touch them. Um, they are clothing. They're my clothing. <laughs> and I can always wash it, so please don't, don't feel shy about touching them. Um, also, I found that the moon has a great connection with the Pleiades star cluster and also with the Hyades star cluster that we can see actually out in the sky tonight if it's clear. The Pleiades are very special. It's the only really fuzzy cluster that you can see in the winter sky. It is visible from every continent on Earth. And so it has great significance for many, many people um, from different cultures. And it's also in a very, very special part of the sky because it is on the ecliptic. So it is where the moon travels, where the sun travels, where the planets travel. So the Pleiades um, 
is typically seen as seven stars. Some people see more, some people see fewer. But in Guatemala, those stars are the stakes in this tool, this uh, very special weaving tool. And they have a name for it. They connect it with the, with the star cluster. They follow the star cluster. And um, it is also because the moon is the patroness of weaving. Um, the other uh, constellation that's very important for weavers is this uh, Y-shaped or V-shaped cluster called the Hyades in the constellation of Taurus. And this tool is used to beat the cotton and remove the seeds before you can spin um, uh, the cotton into thread, which there are several pieces here. There are hand spun cotton. I would call your attention to the one in the right-hand side that has four colors of natural cotton that uh, beige is not woven, I mean, it's not uh, dyed at all. It is all the natural color of cotton and it's hand spun. Um, so I was just so delighted to be able to learn about these traditions, how they are connected with the stars, how they are connected with the moon, and the relationship that people still rekindle um, on a daily basis through their art. Uh, here's th my representation of this relationship between the Hyades on the left, the Pleiades on the right, and the ecliptic going right through the middle. It's called the Golden Gate of the Ecliptic. And if you go out in the night sky uh, on the 29th of January, you will see this very configuration in which the moon will go past the new phase, which will happen on the 21st of, of January. And then by the time you get to the 29th, it'll be uh, uh, going towards full moon, but not quite full. And then you will see it near Mars, not quite at that conjunction, but near enough. And in between these two beautiful constellations that are tied to the weaving practices of so many people in Mesoamerica today. Uh, the work that I do with my colleagues there, it's really about um, strengthening this relationship with the stars uh, at the community level and giving them the agency to pass on this knowledge to future generations. And so um, a lot of astronomy is being taught today uh, in Guatemala and Mexico. And I'm part of a Mother Moon Collective that we just went to Chiapas, uh, Mexico in November to witness the total lunar eclipse that happened on November 8th. I don't know how many people here saw the lunar eclipse. Can I see a show of hands? November 8th, a few of you. OK, so I'm hoping that as part of this interaction here, you will be enticed to follow the moon more closely look up when the next eclipse is, look up about the tides, and really develop your own personal relationship with the moon. So the Pleiades is uh, also a guardian of, of Mother Moon in the sky, uh, and something that's also very important to the work that I have been doing uh, with the many cultures that I have had the joy of working with. And also, because of these conversations that we've been having together, the Pleiades have become part of your practice, Julia. So maybe you could tell us something about this beautiful piece. Um, it, it, when Isabel came to our studio in August and visited and, and spent time with my work, it was just such an incredible response as an astronomer, as a lover of beauty, and also as a parent. You had so many interests. What you saw in the work just gave me so much fuel and energy and inspiration in your interpretation. I, we, I, this literally happened. I actually had to like lie down on the floor at one point when she was talking because it was just like so good, and I've never done that I just before. Took pictures. <laughs> um, but after she left, I just it, it, well, the other thing is in telling me about Pleiades, one thing that came up is in every different culture's store, myth behind the star cluster, it is always a group of women. Um, and I just really wanted to honor the, our connection and the information, the wisdom, the knowledge that you shared with me. And so behind, after our conversation, um, I made this large handmade paper piece. It, this is called Sisters One. Um, and this is um, the whole, the dots. It's turquoise handmade paper that used to be turquoise t-shirts. Um, the Pleiades constellation is the cluster is made up of blue stars. Um, and it's a hand formed paper. The edges are about this thick, and the orientation of the stars in the cluster is based on the position that um, Pleiades rises in the Bay Area that you shared with me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just it was a way of 
just saying thank you, Isabel. Uh, and this is a close up. And so um, you'll see more work as, as we're talking, but um, 12 years ago when my father passed, I, I made a rule that I would never um, put anything on top of the surface of my handmade paper. I wanted it to just be the fibers, the paper, to speak for itself. And this past year, I decided it was time to break my own rule, which is an, kind of an amazing thing to do as, as an artist or a person to decide it's time. And I started um, making watercolors on top of the handmade paper, um, which is transparent, so the paper shows through. And it actually, it, do, it doesn't hide the paper, it actually highlights the irregularities of the surfaces, um, all of its imperfections, and I think some of that circles back to our conversation around the moon. So um, I am gonna play this. Here we go. And we're just turn it up. Yeah, we're just gonna have a conversation now. But um, I just want to go back to you, a partner, and because you're my dear friend and I admire your work as a scientist. Um, I know that um, you know you're uh, an only child and your parents have passed and you are now the elder in your family and I admire that role that you play now and you bring to us and to my family in so many ways. But I wanna ask you, what is your connection as a parent, as a daughter, as a scientist with the moon and the cosmos? Thank you, Isabel. And um, Julia, Isabel has that effect on me too. <laughs> Often after traveling with her or talking with her, I just have to lay down and absorb all the <laughs> awe. I just have to absorb all the awe. Um, I, think, I think the moon really invites us to a change of perspective. And I wanted to invite everyone up f you know, at the end. Um, and Jada, are you here? I'm not sure, Jada and Sue. Yeah. All right. So, Jada, thank you for fixing this in this week. I just wanted to show this. This isn't just the most awesome cosmic tiara ever. Um, but you see, most people don't realize, and it's no fault of their own. It's not that obvious until you learn about it. Uh, it isn't that obvious. Um, that the moon is always half lit. And the phases of the moon we see are a result of our shifting perspective of Earth relative to the moon. So I'm gonna hold this up so everyone can see. The moon is facing towards Isabel, the light. Um, <laughs> and as you can see, the back half is always lit, but now, so please come up and try this. Now you can, <laughs> sorry about that. Now you can see that this, when I look forward, I see the unlit half of the moon. That is new moon. When I look to the sides, I see the half-lit moon. That's the half moon. And when I turn around to the back, which you're looking at, that is the full moon. But the moon you see, thank you, is always half-lit. And I think it invites us to a shifting of perspective. And I'll just say that Although I study the earliest galaxies at present, my career began on the other end of the universe, right next door with the planet Venus. Uh, I worked in planetary astronomy and worked on the Magellan mission to Venus, the first to really m radar map the surface of Venus. Uh, and I remember the dream of going back to the moon in the early 90s as NASA began to ramp back up. And I'm just so delighted, um, even as I worry about a sustainable ethical approach to orbital space and beyond, I am delighted that we, the sexploratory species, are thinking about returning to the moon. And you may have seen the headlines around the Dear Moon Project, a Japanese billionaire bought out a lot of seats on a starship and actually paid for eight in-mission artists so that it's not just the scientists, but artists as well, continuing to tell the story of our relationship to the moon. And I'm very proud that one of our former USF students is among those eight artists. Um, very, very proud, um, Kareem Elia. So as a scientist, I'm delighted. 
as a daughter and as a mother, there are so many calendars that the moon offers. The loss of my father at New Moon on March 24th, 2020, right at the start of the pandemic. He passed away in India in the same hours that the borders closed for over a year. And it was like screaming into the void, as I imagine yelling in space might be, there's just no sound. In all the ways we grieve as a species to gather, to sing, to hold each other, to hold ritual, all of that was denied me and countless others who had losses during the pandemic. So for me, the moon became my record keeper of time passing. And in the Hindu tradition, we mourn for 13 lunar months. One day in the ancestral realm is a year for us, uh, 13 lunar months. And we did a ritual at every new moon in that first year. And it helped me mark time because you know how the pandemic was. We didn't know if a day or a year had gone by. It was like, I think I'm still moving. Um, but it's, it helped me mark time and it helped me honor my grief. So I honor the moon, the moon for that. And last, as a woman, well, if you leave us outside for any length of time, we synchronize with the moon uh, as a collective and individually. And our bodies then become the, a moon calendar as well our bodies, and I say this including and inviting everyone present here, regardless of the gender you identify with, I invite you into your body as calendar that I as a woman have experienced, but that all of us experience. And as we know, in different decades of our life, there's a great deal of tides and flux um, as we grow into new phases of young women and then elders. So thank you, Isabel, for the chance to share that. Thank you very much. And I, uh, now you mentioned the, the, the time of the pandemic. I remember as part of this Mother Moon Collective, we went virtual, right? We, we started to have gatherings uh, through Zoom. And, and we organized so many. As you remember, a partner, we were organizing these, these uh, talks and presentations together to share traditional knowledge and to, to share astronomical knowledge of uh, the latest discoveries. It was just a, a wonderful learning time, but I think that being conscious of these cycles was very important to keep us grounded. And I also wonder, you know, Julia, your, your practice has shifted so much from like, you know, 2007 you did the carving for your father and you used, you know, paper from junk mail and then now you're using t-shirts and uh, something that's much more closer to, to people's personal experience with clothing. So how, how did that feel for you? Thank you for that question. Um, in 2007, I was making paper out of paper. It was all I knew how to do. It was all I could do. I, I did it all with a kitchen blender. I um, went through more than one kitchen blender. Um, <laughs> And I worked with what I had and, and, and what I knew. And um, th the piece, although it was deeply personal, it also felt sort of, um, it felt political in the sense that I was like demanding more time for grief or I was asking for more time for grief than is allotted within the current within the country that we live in, like um, you know, two weeks off for bereavement, for example. Um, and so much of the work happened outside of the house. Uh, and in between 2007 and 2012, I dove deeper into the history of paper making. I learned more about my craft. I had access to different equipment. Um, and I discovered the history of rag paper making. I started making, um, the history of rag paper making is the time in Europe when all the paper was made out of discarded fabrics. Um, many of which were close from homes. And there were many layers of um, invisible, women's invisible labor that went into the textiles, uh, um, collecting the textiles at home, um, and then also sorting the rags at the paper mills. Um, and so it was a way to bring in that history into the work. Um, 
I also was, um, it also brought me one step closer to Korea, to that Jewish mourning tradition where it was about tearing fabric. Mm -hmm. And that felt like the, the right thing to transform fabrics. Um, and then also having, um, more recently, having a child in this phase of my life, I just have had this intense craving to connect the domestic, this is hard to do while I'm talking, the domestic <laughs> and the celestial, um, especially when I'm in the most mundane parts of parenting. Um, I have to remind myself that this period of time is short and that some of the greatest adventures happen within the home. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, a political stance to take. Um, but it also is just so close to me and to use fabrics that are so close to the body, close uh, from our home, from friends' homes, from people I've never met, from their homes. Um, it just took the practice to a much deeper place for me. And it also brought in the possibility for color in a really meaningful way. I was no longer interested in making gray paper. Um, and so um, it started with the bedding because that was really important to me, the, you know, the place where we sleep, where we dream, where we take care of each other. Um, but I also wanted intense colors. I wanted neon yellow, I wanted oranges, I wanted hot pink. And so the 100% the cotton t-shirts that are right on our body, it felt like those fabrics hold stories that we know exist and we know they're there, but we just can't always see them. Thank you so much. Um, actually, maybe we should show this video because you talked yeah. about color. And this shows uh, an artist from Oaxaca that is actually creating natural pigments. You're seeing cochineal, which is an insect that grows on the nopal and makes carminic acid. And so she's putting different amounts of the powder with water in the different glasses. So from light to dark. Sí. Vamos a hacerlo más clarito todavía. Más suave. Ah, mi agua. Oh. Mi bolsa, mi agua. <laughs> sí, vamos a ponerle todavía un poquito más de agua para hacerlo más suave. Y este es como un degradado. Ajá, es un rosa suave. Y este como tiene más es uno más rojito. A este color nosotras le llamamos guinda, pero muchos le dicen vino. Guinda? O púrpura también le dicen. Cherry, either cherry or wine color. Entonces estos son algunos de los colores que sacamos solo con la cochinilla. So those are some of the colors that they get from just Podríamos sacar como seis, desde muy rosa suave como este que casi no tiene color, o como este, que ya viene siendo este. Pero, ahorita solo hicimos tres colores. Ahora con limón, lo vamos a transformar a otros colores. Lo cambiamos a colores naranjas. Ajá. Entonces ya lo hicimos a colores naranjas y así se pueden hacer otros colores también, por ejemplo. So this is a, a just a way in which you can see how they mix mordens, different mordens. Sometimes they use ash, sometimes they use uh, quicklime, sometimes they use lemon juice. But the idea that uh, when they harvest um, these, uh, the cochineal, or when they harvest the plants that they use to make the pigments, are all in concert with the faces of the moon. And, you know, as you mentioned, Aparna, you know, our own uh, human bodies are in concert with, with the moon and the cycles of the stars, the cycles of, of the sun, you know, our mood, uh, our sense of well-being, our daily... Um, activities are, are, whether or not we do it consciously or not, are in concert with, with the cosmos. 
And so the idea that they're also still keeping those traditions, I find it really fascinating and, and, and a source of hope for, my, for myself that people are still so connected. And so I take example from uh, my collaborations with them. So should we open it up for questions? I don't know, Sam, if you want to help us with that. So just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you so everyone can hear. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing presentation. You guys are, are terrific. I really enjoyed this. And Aparna, I think you mentioned that you had a postdoctoral fellowship with the National Science Foundation related to satellites. And you had mentioned in your slideshow that we need to be more conscientious and thoughtful about the satellites that we're deploying. Could you talk about the work that you did in your fellowship and how we can be more conscientious? Thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you everyone for your time on a weeknight. Uh, so, and I'm sorry if I garbled it, my postdoctoral fellowship was primarily making predictions for James Webb. Uh, and I spent, part of that was, you had to spend your summers teaching and I was uh, teaching tribal youth through a campus program at CU Boulder. However, the last few years I have been working a lot on satellite constellations and their impacts. Uh, it is a much longer answer. I'm giving a talk in a week up at Robert Ferguson Observatory, and I could tell you more about that rather than spamming everyone with a, hey, well, hey let me tell you what I'm doing in a week. Um, <laughs> but, I, I, but the brief answer is satellites have a very worthy goal of bringing affordable broadband worldwide. Uh, and the pandemic revealed that it's essential, an essential utility and it's basically something that's a necessity of modern life. It's also an enormous economic uh, development opportunity f for a lot of developing nations. There's a lot of education, medicine, progress that could, be, could happen with satellites. But the worthy goal is of the democratization of space. But there's a lot of planned uh, milestones that will lead to known uh, negative impacts, including brightening of the skies. There's already too many streaks in astronomical images, but the aggregate effect of tens of thousands of satellites, the skies will steadily brighten. Uh, debris and uh, traffic congestion up there, uh, not just in Bay Area highways, but up there. Uh, debris uh, is an enormous concern and also enormous environmental degradation at the launch sites in orbit and in decommissioning, all that stuff has to go somewhere. Uh, the deposits of uh, metal oxides in the atmosphere is already it, having an impact. When they get decommissioned into the ocean, that affects ocean health. So there's a broad range of impacts. Uh, so I think what I and my collaborators try to advocate for is to slow down and assess the impact before proceeding at such a precipitous rate. And by the way, the economic model has not yet been demonstrated where the company's making a profit and while delivering cheap global broadband. So we, we just need to slow down. Yeah. Thank you, though. No, I don't really have a question. I just want to say it. what a stunning presentation this was. Uh, it's, it's an amazing linkage between science and art and humanity. Uh, I'm just very impressed with the three of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. He's a former colleague of mine up at the Space Sciences Lab and CEA, but he's not a plant. He's not a plant. He's a friend. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> I have to say, um, one of the gifts that Isabel gave me in the studio, in addition to the Pleiades constellation, in the images, um, there's a reoccurring uh, um, 
a, sh a composition where it's this constantly expanding circle. And I, I always thought of it as this call to look up, to look to the cosmos. Um, and when you came to the studio uh, as an astronomer, I, I thought you might see that. But actually, as a parent, I just wanted to share with everybody your read on that composition, that ever-expanding orbit. You, you actually told me, this is, this is your child, Julia. Um, every minute, every hour, every day, every year, they can go further from you before they return. And in that moment, you completely connected to me. You reminded me that there are echoes between the orbits in home with the orbits in the sky. Um, and that was a gift you shared with me that, that I wanted to share. And it changes the way I see shapes. Permanently. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. And I also just want to, you know, encourage all of us to recognize our amazing capacity to use our own bodies as the instrument of observation. We have all the capacities to understand the universe from the ground up. And as we gaze up, you can really, by paying attention and being consistent with that relationship, uncover so much of this cosmic order, if you just give yourself that permission. It's, I'm not just gushing poetic here. I'm truly encouraging all of us to go back to that deep essence of who we are, the ancestors, the stars as our earliest connection, the trees as the oldest teachers on Earth, because they were here before animals, before us. Recognize that capacity. Recognize your own potential to teach yourself, to teach your children, and to be better citizens of our planet. That's what it's all about. And the only way that we're going to be better citizens of our planet is if we gaze up and connect back with the sky. I truly believe that. That is something that I will spend the rest of my life believing and trying to make it come true. Thank you so much. Uh, you three are almost a fabric textile of braiding <laughs> yourselves together here for us. Um, my question is, um, is Isabel, I think these are your textiles. Um, I'm curious, you've spoken a lot about the origin, the culture, the color. And I'm curious if you can share with us any more info about some of these beautiful patterns or significance. I see there's many different countries represented. Could you speak more to that? Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I, I will share a story that's very close to my heart, and, and I think that um, it has expanded my view of what textile traditions are. And I want to point to this piece on the right-hand side there, which is um, cotton and wool. And it's from a place in Chiapas, uh, southern Mexico, uh, Maya Tzotzil people. Um, the artist is Alberto Lopez. Um, so there's a story about um, how people become good weavers in the highlands. Um, and the story goes that to become a good weaver, you must go out in the full moon into the mountain to find this one plant that blooms with a white flower only during full moon, and you must eat this plant. And so the women do this. The girls do this from very little. They go in groups, and they will actually connect together with the moon, and they will eat this plant. And that gives them the um, almost traditional heritage to become good weavers. So this young man um, and another friend of his uh, as well, he, he shares a similar story, that they wanted the grandmothers to teach them as boys to, to weave. Um, and the grandmothers wouldn't do it. She says, no, because you're supposed to be in the cornfield and, and you know the, the girls are supposed to be weaving. And he kept insisting and insisting and she would never teach him. And so he started following the, the girls and he saw this tradition taking place during a full moon night. And he hid in the bushes and when the women went back down, he went and he ate the flower. 
And so he, and this is a true story. Pedro Mesa from from uh, San Cristobal de las Casas. If you've ever been there, he he um, facilitates the Snajolobil textile cooperative. And so he came back down and asked one more time to the grandma, and the grandmother said, "I will teach you one pattern." And so he said that he started seeing colors when she was teaching this pattern. And now he has become one of the premier weavers um, in this area, and he has. Um, recovered the ancestral designs from the steli or the carved um, uh, columns and friezes from the ancestral side of Yaschilan, Palenque, uh, Tikal. So you, if, if you're familiar with the Maya world, you may have been to these places. But now he um, is trying to really preserve this tradition and pass it on to future generations, together with 800 women and men that are part of the cooperative. So I think this is a story of resilience. It's a story of evolution. It's a story of belonging. Um, so I, I just learned a lot from the people that I work with. The, each one of these pieces has, has a story behind it. I tried to kind of write it into the tag, so you might want to take a peek in, in a while, but um, each each piece has a story, and I, I know what I en encourage my <laughs> my future generations to please pay attention and <laughs> and read about the stories, which I will continue to keep writing, so that they take on a significant meaning of connection. And they, but they are clothing. I wear them. I wash them. I take them to the cleaners. I, you know, sometimes they get hung up on a on a nail or whatever. They are clothing. They're living expressions of art. They're living expressions of culture and connection. And I'm just honored to be able to contribute to the preservation of this art, which is very multifaceted and very important, and all connected to the moon. Thank you for your question. May I just say. It's really fun to dance around the world with Isabel in these outfits. <laughs> it is. She's an awesome and award-winning salsa dancer, and it is fun to dance around the world, around the world with her. If there are no more questions from the audience, um, I'll rest assured that the conversations can continue. The space will be open in, uh, for another 20 minutes or so. And our guests are um, going to be meandering and mingling, and um, can sh you can share some of the demonstration. I want to thank our uh, technical crew who helped make this happen. Uh,